Ontario Human Rights Commission. Uh, when I, I read the Ontario Human Rights Commission uh, report um, called Right to Read, um, I was quite surprised and, and disturbed uh, because uh, it seemed to present a, uh, an analysis of the causes of reading failure in Ontario that implicated the entire approach to reading instruction uh, in the province. Uh, it also uh, provided a, I think, quite a distorted view of the actual accomplishments in literacy of students in the province. And so I wrote a, a five page um, uh, critique of the report, uh, which I'll go through in the presentation and uh, then open it up for, for discussion. Um, the, the danger uh, of the emphasis that's incorporated into the Right to Read report is that uh, if we look at what has happened elsewhere, for example, in the United States, it risks um, promoting a, a direct instruction, um, back to basics, narrowed curriculum with uh, an emphasis on phonics instruction to the exclusion of uh, much of the other, of many of the other components that are important for reading. So I'll elaborate on those issues uh, now. So I'm going to share my screen and um, hopefully this will work okay. Um, okay. Okay, can you see that okay? Yes, we can. Okay, great, thank you. Yes. So um, what you see on the right-hand side is the uh, first paragraph of uh, the critique that I wrote. Um, and I labeled it as a, a sincere, passionate, but flawed uh, report. And uh, I'll just kind of give you a sense of what I want to say in some of the, um, uh, the, the emphasis in, in the critique by just uh, going through the first paragraph. It says, empathy and outrage in equal measure flow through the pages of this landmark report that highlights the personal and societal consequences of reading difficulties in Ontario schools. There's empathy for the children who experience dyslexia and for the families that struggle financially to provide private assessment and specialized tuition when they have the means to support their children's challenging journey into literacy. There's outrage about the fact that Ontario is not fulfilling its Supreme Court of Canada obligation to recognize that learning to read is a basic and essential human right that legally requires Ontario students to ensure that all students acquire functional reading skills. So, you know, I see the report as an important report, um, uh, but uh, also a flawed report. And I'll try to highlight uh, both those aspects uh, in, the, in the next 20 minutes or so. So what the report gets right, um, uh, it makes valuable recommendations about how Ontario schools can improve the ways in which they identify children with dyslexia and the instructional supports that are required to help them decode words and acquire the reading comprehension and writing skills necessary to participate effectively in society. It makes a persuasive case that this is an issue of social justice that requires far more attention and financial resources than it, it has received up to this point. This is the major um, uh, thrust of the uh, of the report, and I think it's it's timely, it's overdue, and it should be acted on uh, with as much um, uh, speed as possible by the province and by school boards. Um, the reality is that children who experience dyslexia are currently not being well served in Ontario schools. Uh, inability to read does represent a crisis for these children and their families. And as recommended by the report, educators and policymakers need to set up an assessment and intervention infrastructure within the Ontario education system to ensure that children who are having difficulty acquiring decoding skills receive timely and effective support to assist their uh, journey into literacy. Um, the report also addresses some of the assessment and instructional issues related to multilingual learners. It addresses these in a very general way. They rely uh, mainly on the very useful uh, research of doc, uh, my colleague, Dr. Esther Geva from OISE. Um, um, and the, their um, 
major point is that multilingual learners who are learning the language of instruction in the early grades and appear to be struggling to learn to read should be monitored by means of curriculum-based assessment and uh, curriculum-based assessment and response to intervention, with much less emphasis placed on standardized tests whose norms are largely invalid for this population. However, they don't go into any detail about the complexities of this process, and the paucity of relevant research uh, is not acknowledged in the report. Um, and multilingual assessment possibilities are not even mentioned. So it acknowledges that there are issues related to the assessment of multilingual learners, but basically slides over what the implications uh, of, uh, of that uh, reality uh, are. Um, but unfortunately, from my perspective, um, the Ontario Human Rights Commission undermines the important message that it has as its, as its main um, uh, goal to get across. Uh, and they, they risk um, undermining this message when they stray from the specific challenges faced by children with dyslexia and other forms of reading difficulties into a more general condemnation of the Ontario educational system. It makes two dubious claims to explain what they see as the reading difficulties of children in Ontario schools. First, it makes a case, to, uh, it attempts to make a case that Ontario schools are failing to teach reading skills effectively for all students, not just those with specific reading disabilities. So much of the report is focused on a critique of how reading is taught in Ontario schools. Um, and secondly, it attributes this failure, this perceived failure, to the fact that most Ontario schools implement a balanced approach to reading instruction, which the report claims pays insufficient attention to teaching sound letter correspondences, phonemic awareness, and phonics in a systematic, explicit, and intensive way. Now, contrary to the claims of the OHRC, Canada has long been recognized as among the top performers internationally and across Canada in reading performance. Um, and in the critique that I wrote, I pull out, uh, I mainly uh, pull out data from the Program for International Student Assessment. This is the um, international assessment uh, project that the, the um, uh, uh, Economic and, and Social uh, Research, in, sorry, the, um, uh, the OECD, the, um, uh, um, uh, the, the uh, uh, what is it, the, uh, uh, the Economic uh, and uh, Cultural um, Research in, uh, Institute that's based in Paris. Um, they've been comparing for the last 20 years, more than 80, 80 students uh, reading and science and math uh, achievement. Um, uh, it's up to over 80 students at this point, it started out with uh, uh, considerably fewer uh, um, uh, countries involved. Um, what they have found in their most recent report published in 2019, um, is that Ontario, the Ontario average for English language schools was 527. Um, this places Ontario English language schools reading performance second in Canada behind only Alberta and behind only China uh, and four provinces in China and Singapore internationally. So Ontario English schools are a third out of 80, more than 80 countries in terms of reading performance among 15 uh, year old students. It's far superior to the reading performance of most other English dominant countries. For example, the UK gets a score of 504, US 505, Australia 503, New Zealand 506. And so another aspect of this is that Ontario students reading scores as measured by the PISA tests are not in decline. They've been stable between uh, the year 2000 and 2018. According to the, to the OECD, the stable performance in reading over the past 20 years contrasts with what they call the steadily negative trend experienced by countries such as Australia, Finland, Iceland, and New Zealand. Um, the strong performance uh, in reading of Ontario schools is reinforced by the Pan-Canadian Assessment Program. Uh, this is a, a program organized by the Canadian Council of Ministers of Education. And um, uh, th their report, which is published in uh, 2021, 
uh, reported data from the 2019 assessment. You can see there that Ontario is uh, tops in terms of reading achievement among Canadian provinces with a score of 517, uh, which is far above the Canadian average. Um, so these data, um, and, and there's much more data that could be uh, brought in here, uh, they clearly re refute the uh, Ontario Human Rights uh, Commission claim that Ontario is failing to teach its students to read. Uh, to read. Uh, Ontario education is not experiencing a crisis with respect to literacy outcomes. The OECD PISA data demonstrates that Ontario 15-year-old students on average are reading significantly better than their peers in most other English-speaking countries, as well as outperforming students in countries around the world. Um, however, I want to just emphasize the fact that the OHRC report is absolutely on target when it says that Ontario could be doing a much better job of addressing the reading difficulties of students who are experiencing dyslexia. Um, the, se the second aspect of the report that I find uh, very problematic is their endorsement of what I'm calling the phonics as panacea um, uh, orientation to reading instruction. They, dr they draw from the so-called science of reading, which is a, a movement that has become very prominent in the United States over the last uh, three or four years in particular. You can see a, um, uh, a description of it from the uh, report on the right-hand side. Um, and um, the claim in all of these accounts uh, connected to the science of reading is that th there is consensus among the scientific community and this consensus is supported by a vast amount of research evidence that explicit standalone systematic phonics, phonics instruction is a crucial element in helping children learn to read. Now, I believe that phonics instruction is an important element in helping children learn to read, but when we look at how that um, has played itself out in the United States over the last 20 years, uh, we see some uh, strong warning signs about what that implies for instruction. So within this narrative, systematic phonics instruction is typically, typically contrasted with balanced reading instruction, which is caricatured either as not treating phonics, not teaching phonics at all, or teaching it in an ineffective and non-systematic way. Um, and much of the uh, rhetoric, both in the um, OHRC, uh, OHRC report and in the science of reading, um, um, documentation and, and media articles involves the demonization of balanced literacy as whole language in disguise. Uh, there's a, a quote from uh, Louisa Motes um, in the OHRC report it's, that goes like this. It says, approaches such as balanced reading, uh, sorry, approaches such as balanced literacy, um, sorry, uh, do not complement text reading and writing with strong systematic skills-based instruction in spite of their claims. Only programs that teach all components of reading, as well as writing and oral language, will be able to prevent and ameliorate reading problems in the large number of children at, at risk. Um, now, the OHRC report does acknowledge that more than just phonics is required in an effective reading program. Uh, they say early word reading skills are critical, but they're not the only necessary components in reading outcomes. Robust evidence-based phonics and phonics programs should be one part of a broader evidence-based rich classroom arts rich classroom language arts instruction, including, but not limited to storytelling, book reading, drama, and text analysis. Unfortunately, that's about as much as, as, uh, uh, as what the uh, report says about these uh, components of reading instruction. So they acknowledge it in essentially one or two sentences, uh, but they say nothing more about what the balance should be between these components and explicit systematic phonics instruction. Um, so I want to suggest that the ORC, o o OHRC report has looked at just one side of the coin, um, and it has misrepresented the empirical evidence on the impact of uh, phonics instruction, and it also ignores a massive amount of research on the impact of active literacy engagement on the part of students. Um, when we look at uh, the, some of the major reports that the OHRC report um, relies on, such as the National Reading Panel, which was a, 
a, uh, a major report on reading in the United States published in the year 2000 uh, that made a strong case that systematic phonics instruction is an um, important and necessary component in, in teaching kids how to read. Um, but researchers who endorse a balanced approach to early reading are much more closely aligned with the actual findings of the National Reading Panel than is the case for science of reading advocates. The NRP analysis did report a positive impact of systematic phonics instruction on both decoding and reading comprehension for kindergarten and grade one students. However, it also reported, and this is totally ignored by uh, the OHRC report, that no relationship between systematic phonics instruction and reading comprehension was found after grade one for normally achieving and low achieving readers. So phonics instruction rapidly reaches a point of diminishing returns. Um, for students classified as reading disabled, some impact of phonics instruction and comprehension was observed in grades two to, th two to three, sorry, two to six, probably because by definition, these students experience longer term difficulty in decoding than is the case for normally developing readers. You can see on the left of the slide there, a couple of quotes from uh, an, an article by two of, by four of the um, National Reading Panel report uh, panelists, uh, where they acknowledge the uh, fact that phonics instruction rapidly reaches a point of diminishing returns. They say among the older students in second through sixth grades, phonics instruction was not effective for teaching spelling or to teaching reading comprehension. They go on to say readers in second through sixth grades classified as low achieving revealed no overall effects of phonics instruction on reading comprehension. So um, the case for systematic phonics instruction uh, it, with respect to promoting reading comprehension is not clear at all. Um, they also, the OHRC report also fails to acknowledge that the National Reading Panel endorsed a balanced approach to reading instruction. The panel cautioned against one size fits all approaches and emphasized that, and this is a quote, systematic phonics instruction should be integrated with other reading instruction to create a balanced reading program. The panel also advocated the use of high quality literature and cautioned that phonics should not become the dominant component in a reading program, neither in the amount of time devoted to it, nor in the significance attached. Uh, the National Reading Panel went on to express concern about the commonly heard call for intensive systematic phonics instruction and drew attention to the possible effects of scripted programs on teachers' orientation to instruction. Although scripts may standardize instruction, they may reduce teachers' interest in the teaching process or their motivation to teach phonics. So when we look at what happened in the United States after the publication of the National Reading Panel report, this was picked up by uh, the Bush administration who set up a panel of people to administer, panel of researchers to administer uh, the Reading First program. And they put $6 billion into this program over a six year period. And the goal was admirable to help low income students uh, learn to read. And however, the panel was motivated by ideological uh, considerations, namely that phonics was the only thing that mattered in terms of early reading instruction. And reading first, uh, the, the reading first panel in distributing this uh, billion dollars a year to school systems demanded that schools implement exactly the kind of intensive systematic phonics instruction that the NRP panel had warned against. Balanced reading instruction was demonized and standalone one size fits all phonics instruction isolated from any engagement with meaningful text was required as a condition for funding. For example, phonics programs that included classroom libraries and an emphasis on teaching sound symbol relationships through writing instruction were deemed to be inconsistent with scientifically based reading research. Now, the outcomes of this $6 billion investment were bleak, uh, as reflected or dismal, uh, as reflected in the following excerpts from the evaluation report. Reading First did not produce a statistically significant impact on student reading comprehension test scores in grades one, two, or three. Reading First had no statistically significant impacts on student engagement with print. So basically $6 billion were flushed down the toilet 
because of uh, the way in which the National Reading Panel report was interpreted and because of a failure to accurately um, uh, review and reflect what the research findings were actually saying. If we want to see what's happening right now in the United States, as the science of reading movement has uh, spread across many states and, and has been implemented in a number of states, uh, I was um, uh, able to participate in a, in a panel um, at the California Association for Biling Bilingual Education Conference just about a week ago. And the, um, the National Committee for Effective Literacy, which is a group that's been set up in the United States, uh, looked at what was happening in a number of states as the science of reading uh, uh, movement uh, influenced what uh, influenced policies in the states. And Mississippi is a good example. Um, this is a slide from uh, their presentation. Um, in first grade, if you add up the phonics instruction with vocabulary from decodable books, small group instruction with decodables, and learning center time with phonics, it comes to about 70 to 90 minutes per day of phonics instruction. Uh, there's no time allotted for oral language development or English language development for multilingual students. If you add 45 minutes for math, that means that there's no time for science, social studies, art, music, or, or physical education. And this is a replication of the narrowing of the curriculum that happened um, in the uh, United States with the No Child Left Behind uh, legislation, of which Reading First was uh, a component. Um, now, the Mississippi says, hey, look, our fourth grade scores have gone up. They've gone up because of the fact that they've retained all of the students in grade three who didn't meet the criterion for advancement to grade four. So naturally, uh, grade four students or the grade four scores are going to go up, but you've got a huge backlog of students who've been retained in grade three. Um, so basically, um, in terms of my uh, critique of the report, uh, first of all, they misrepresent the uh, achievement of Ontario students in reading. Ontario students are internationally recognized as amongst the strongest readers in the world. Um, so there is no crisis in literacy instruction in Ontario schools, apart from the fact that we're not doing a good job in providing support for students who are experiencing dyslexia or other forms of reading difficulties. And secondly, the report misinterprets the research on phonics instruction, uh, doesn't acknowledge the fact that according to the National Reading Panel, phonics instruction reaches a, a rapidly reaches a point of diminishing returns and has no impact on reading comprehension after grade one. Um, and instead they promote or they push a phonics as panacea uh, orientation that essentially distorts what the research is saying. Um, so I want to move on to uh, the second part of the presentation. And the point I wanna make here is that a large majority of researchers including those who argue for the importance of systematic phonics instruction, actually advocate a balanced approach to literacy instruction, understood as the integration of differentiated phonics instruction with a strong focus on promoting active engagement with reading and writing. And throughout the uh, OHRC report, there's virtually no mention made of the importance of ensuring that students have print access and get actively engaged with reading and writing. And it's important to highlight that phonics instruction should be differentiated, particularly if we're looking at uh, students from multilingual backgrounds who are in our classes, who are learning English at the same time as they're learning how to read. Um, and even with a, if we were talking about a monolingual uh, group of, of students, of English speaking students, um, there's gonna be large differences in, among those students in their understanding of print, in where they are in terms of, um, uh, decoding skills, and that needs to be taken into account in instruction rather than have a one size fits all approach. So, one of the um, recent reviews of the research literature that I uh, cited in the critique is a report that came out in February of this year by British researchers Dominic Wise and Alice Bradbury. Um, and they carried out what they called a systematic qualitative metasynthesis of the empirical evidence. And they concluded that 
uh, the intensive phonics approach implemented over the past 20 years in England is not sufficiently underpinned by the research evidence. Their overall conclusion is that the teaching of phonics and reading and curriculum policy and practice should more closely reflect the evidence that contextualized teaching of reading or balanced instruction is the most effective way to teach reading. Um, if we look at the research on the role of literacy engagement, uh, one of the people who have been, has been very prominent in that is a, a cognitive psychologist called John Guthrie, who teaches out of the University of Baltimore. And what he means by reading engagement or literacy engagement is the amount and range of reading and writing, use of effective strategies for deep understanding of text, and the positive effect in what I and other people would call identity investment in reading and writing. He, he notes that in all spheres of life, for example, driving a car, doing surgery, gourmet cooking, whatever, participation is key to the development of proficiency. He makes the point that certainly some initial lessons are valuable for driving a car or typing on a keyboard, but expertise spirals upward, mainly with engaged participation. And if we look at, at some of the research um, relating to uh, literacy engagement, uh, when students get actively engaged with literacy from an early stage, from the day they walk into school, if they're immersed in a literacy rich environment, uh, that has an, can have a major impact on pushing back the negative effects of low socioeconomic status. Um, the research of uh, people like Nell Duke and uh, Newman and Solano and, and others have highlighted the fact that students growing up in poverty typically experience significantly less, written less exposure to written language in their homes, often in their schools and neighborhoods. For example, um, they've shown that the um, offerings in public libraries in the United States in low income areas are far less um, rich uh, than is the case for higher income students, the offerings for, for children. Um, and a, an extremely large body of research demonstrates the causal relationship between print access and literacy engagement and literacy achievement. And this holds for both native speakers and second language speakers of the school language. And I'll be happy to share um, reviews that I've done of this research. Guthrie um, has highlighted uh, this uh, research um, as showing that students whose family background was characterized by low income and low education, but who are highly engaged readers, substantially outscored students who came from backgrounds with higher education and higher income, but who themselves were less engaged readers. Based on a massive sample, this finding suggests a stunning conclusion that engaged reading can overcome traditional barriers to reading achievement, including gender, parental education, and income. Some of the um, Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development uh, research is really interesting in this regard. For example, in their 2010 report, uh, they found that there was about a one-third overlap between the negative effects uh, of low socioeconomic status uh, on reading and the positive effects of reading engagement. In other words, what this implies is that if we could get students from low-income backgrounds actively engaged with reading from a very early stage of their schooling, we could potentially push back about one third of the negative effects of low socioeconomic status. If we look at um, some of the longer term effects of a literacy rich environment, whether it's in the home or in a preschool environment, there's a, a study or series of studies carried out in New Zealand that are not well known. I've never seen these cited um, in, in the literature on these issues but they're carried out by um, uh, Wiley and, and colleagues. And they highlighted, um, they looked at uh, a number of preschool uh, centers in New Zealand, and they rated these preschool centers according to a number of criteria. Um, some of these were, uh, these are the criteria, staff responsiveness to children, staff actively guiding children in activities, et cetera. So the, the first four deal with the equality of interaction between the staff and students. But the fifth one is providing a print saturated environment. Um, and this one is particularly important for children who may not be experiencing a print saturated environment in their homes. So they describe a print saturated environment as follows. They say an early childhood education center that achieved the highest possible rating 
for provision of a print saturated environment would be very print focused. It would encourage print awareness in children's activities, have a lot of printed material visible around the center at children's eye level or just above and offer children a range of readily accessible books. A center that scored the lowest possible rating would have no print evident at all, no books, posters, or other forms of writing. So what do they find? At age 10 for children from low income homes, there was a difference of 18 percentage points in reading comprehension between those who attended the least and most print saturated uh, early childhood centers. At age 14, students who had attended a non-print focused ECE centers scored 12 to 15 percentage points lower than the three other quartile groups who had experienced greater print saturation in the preschool stage. And so if we ask ourselves, why is it that children from middle-class backgrounds uh, tend to have relatively few difficulties in acquiring reading skills compared to children from low-income backgrounds? One of the reasons is that typical middle-class homes saturate their children with literacy from the time they're toddlers. Their children are typically surrounded by books. They see their parents reading, uh, parents are reading stories to them. And this socialization process matters. Children who are growing up in poverty, uh, whose parents don't have the money to buy books, um, are typically not ex exposed to the same kind of print environment at the preschool level. So you have a four year socialized, print socialization advantage that's operating here. And what the New Zealand studies suggest is that at the preschool level, we can uh, compensate for that by creating that print immersion uh, in the preschool experience. They're not talking about teaching phonics. They're talking about doing exactly the same kinds of things that many of our own children and, and us ourselves have uh, experienced uh, at the preschool stage. So basically, my interpretation of what the research is saying is as follows. It's obviously essential to develop students' ability to decode written language, and phonics instruction is an important part of that process. However, knowing how to decode does not directly lead to reading comprehension. Decoding is a necessary, but not a sufficient condition for reading comprehension. And reading comprehension is much more directly related to the degree to which students get actively engaged with reading and writing. And a focus on literacy engagement should start in the preschool, for example, listening to and dramatizing stories long before any formal decoding instruction takes place. And this is particularly important for low-income students who may have experienced relatively, relatively little print access in the home. I'm not going to go into part three because I haven't completed it yet, but basically what I'm doing here is compiling uh, a series of quotations from uh, many of the most prominent reading researchers in the field. Many of them are uh, buy into the science of reading in the sense that they believe phonics instruction is important, which it is. Um, but they also emphasize the fact that it's not the whole story. And I've labeled this beyond dueling dichotomies. And some illustrative quotations highlighting commonalities in the recommendations of researchers regarding effective reading instruction. I'll just show you uh, one of uh, these uh, from Mark Seidenberg, who's a prominent advocate for the science of reading. Um, but if you look down at the bottom there, he says, in, in extreme cases that we have observed, first grade reading instruction consists of blocks of time spent on each of the national reading panel components in the order they were presented in the report. The focus on the components leaves little time for reading and talking about books. Um, you go on to say, um, if you just in terms of the national reading panel uh, components over on the right hand side there, uh, reading has components, but the components are not independent and taking them as the targets for reading instruction is a mistake. Um, they go on to say that, um, where are we? Um, in, in extreme cases that we've observed, each component is taught separately, 10 minutes a day on phonemic awareness, 15 minutes on phonics, 15 on fluency and so on. This is a misapplication of the findings. Reading does incorporate the five components, but the further assumption that there are skills to be taught is not warranted. Riding a bicycle is a complex event governed by physics, geometry, air resistance, gravity, etc. cetera. Uh, all true, but irrelevant to teaching a child to write. Um, and on the left-hand side, they talk about the balance between implicit learning and explicit instruction. 
Um, and they say for, for problems such as learning how to pronounce letter strings or spell, a large amount of implicit learning combined with a smaller amount of explicit instruction seems to be optimal. And this is very similar to what John Guthrie was saying when he says that some explicit instruction is important to get going, but expertise spirals upward with engaged participation. So let me stop there and um, um, I'll try to kind of clarify anything that uh, has not been clear in the, in the presentation. So I'll, I'll stop sharing my screen at this point. Thank you, Jim. Does anyone have questions or? Um, Laura? Hi, thank you so much. So insightful and helpful. Um, of course, I'm thinking I'm secondary, so I'm thinking a lot about um, adolescents and teens learning to read uh, for the first time, potentially, and whether the same thinking applies um, in terms of phonics instruction and how, how much, how focused, how long, how balanced. <laughs> yeah, the, I guess like a, a lot of what I've been trying to say is that part of the science of reading approach uh, and that the Ontario uh, uh, Human Rights Commission has bought into uh, is directed at demonizing balanced instruction. What I've tried to show is that we need a balance. Um, we need to make sure that kids can decode. And that applies whether we're talking about 13-year-old, 14-year-old kids, as opposed to uh, seven-year-old kids. And so I'm certainly not arguing against the teaching of phonics. Uh, but when we look at how this was, has been interpreted, particularly in the United States, but also in the UK right now, where phonics is taught as a separate block, uh, totally divorced from actual reading, totally divorced from uh, discussing texts, um, and so all of the literacy socialization that you know, most of us in this room probably have experienced as children ourselves and we make available to our own kids, that, that is also an essential aspect of helping students learn to read. And so with secondary students, um, you want to, I think, highlight the fact that um, uh, print is an essential aspect of functioning in the kind of society that we have. For students who have not had the opportunity to uh, attend school or attended minimal school um, and have not learned how to read in their home language, um, ideally, um, we would be able to make use of that first language as a stepping stone to English. That's often not the, the case because we don't speak the, the different languages. Um, but we want to make sure that there's motivation there on the part of students. Uh, we want to enable students to use their entire cognitive potential as adolescents uh, to help make sense of the, of, the, um, uh, of the print. We need to demystify how the sounds of English relate to the uh, printed language. So phonics instruction is an important part of this, but it's going to be, I think, much more engaging for students if it's done in a way that is tied into getting access to texts that are culturally appropriate, that are relevant to students' lives. And so again, the same kind of focus on balance, uh, I think operates no matter whether we're talking about adolescents or children just starting school. Thank you for that. There's a question in the chat box. Um, you've given us so many things to think about. Do you feel that there should be a methodolo uh, sorry, methodological approach? And what is the role of teachers uh, college to better support reading? I think one of the points that the um, Ontario Human Rights Commission report makes uh, is that reading instruction could be um, much better handled at the uh, in faculties of education for uh, new teachers who are going through the Bachelor of Education uh, program. Um, and certainly an increased focus on effective teaching of reading, I think would be something that uh, should be considered by all faculties of education. 
the danger is that you go in, in the same direction as has happened in many parts of the United States, where what has been interpreted as effective reading instruction is basically standalone, an hour of filling in um, worksheets relating to phonics, no engagement with actual literacy, no rich literacy environment. So certainly um, help new teachers or teacher candidates to uh, teach phonics uh, effectively. But what the research is saying is that if we can get students started in, in learning um, uh, and de demystifying phonics, um, uh, demystifying the relationship between the sounds and symbols of the language, uh, then a lot of that will begin to happen uh, on, uh, through students' actual engagement with, with print. So we, we would certainly focus on phonics. We differentiate our instructions so the students who are having more difficulty, whether they're coming from multilingual backgrounds or English uh, backgrounds, uh, that they get additional help. Um, but we, uh, and so that it, within teacher education um, faculties, uh, ways of doing that should be highlighted. Uh, but we don't buy into the notion that balanced approaches to literacy are evidence-free. They're absolutely not. There's a huge amount of research out there showing that providing a rich literacy environment uh, that immerses or saturates children with exposure to books and print, where there are interesting conversations about books, uh, where children are learning about animals, about science, um, all of that is equally important as explicit teaching of phonics in, in helping children learn to read. So, you know, we can look south of the border uh, as a cautionary tale of what not to do. And unfortunately, the, my reading of the OHRC, OHRC report is that it is quite unbalanced in its um, treatment of what the research is actually saying. It's looked at one side of the coin and has refused or declined to turn the coin around and see the amount of research that's there showing that print access and literacy engagement are huge components in the development of reading comprehension. Another question, it says, I'm curious to know if the report noted any findings or comments regarding the role of first language assessments for newcomer MLLs in understanding the supports required for transitioning reading behaviors and comprehension to English. Uh, no. Uh, unless I missed something, the report says nothing about first language assessment. Um, the, the, some of the work that Esther Gava has been involved in and, uh, and others show that if we want to get a better sense of a student's total vocabulary knowledge um, and or reading uh, comprehension or for newcomer students, um, uh, their knowledge of science, assessing in both languages or providing the assessment uh, in both languages uh, results in better performance on the part of students than providing it in one or the other. Um, so there's certainly an important role for multilingual assessment, uh, but we're still uh, at a very early stage in uh, making that happen. The, the focus in the report, even though it's considered in a very um, uh, brief way uh, on curriculum-based assessment and essentially teachers observing how children are um, uh, learning how to read, identifying children who seem to be having more difficulty, providing um, what in um, uh, response to intervention, jargon is, is called tier two interventions where additional help is provided to those students. And then if they're still not making good progress, then a more formal assessment might be carried out with uh, uh, more intensive uh, instruction. That is, uh, I think, an appropriate response but that should be ideally complemented by multilingual assessment where it's possible. Do you by chance have a number? Um, someone is curious about the ML family input into the report. Were there like how many were there and how were they um, represented or how um, representative are they, are they of the numbers? I don't have the, uh, that figure. It may be in the report uh, itself, the, uh, the, the full report. They, they certainly um, uh, consulted uh, widely with, uh, with teachers, uh, with families, uh, but I suspect that they were uh, uh, consulting with families primarily whose children were experiencing uh, reading difficulties. It's, it would be very easy to go back and, and check that out in 
I think it's maybe chapter three or or four of the of the full report. Uh, but I didn't I didn't register that they had specifically uh, sought to engage multilingual families. But you know they may have. But I I don't have that information. And one more question: What recommendations do you have for Ergo to collectively promote this counter narrative with our boards and with the MOE? Um, I would uh, basically highlight the fact that uh, Ergo is aware of what the research is saying, and the research uh, and the recommendations of the most prominent uh, reading researchers in the field uh, are far more nuanced than those that are um, emphasized in the OHRC report. The researchers in the field, whether they uh, endorse a science of reading approach that focuses on or that highlights the importance of providing phonics instruction, or whether they are more skeptical of that, all highlight the importance of uh, combining phonics instruction as needed and differentiated phonics instruction because one size fits all doesn't fit the reality of our classrooms. Uh, they highlight the importance of combining that with a rich print environment and a rich orientation to literacy that involves uh, read alouds by teachers, discussion of books, a strong focus on writing. So when you read the um, uh, what the researchers are actually saying and when you read what the National Reading Panel has said, uh, it's very clear that they see phonics instruction as one important component of a much broader orientation to literacy. In the, um, uh, I'll finish up the PowerPoint uh, today that we'll have a lot of those quotations in there uh, of what people uh, in the reading field are saying. Uh, and so I would use those quotations uh, to highlight the fact that um, any interpretation of the OR, uh, OHRC report that basically says kids have got to get um, 60 minutes of standalone kill and drill phonics instruction, uh, uh, filling in worksheets, that that is not the implication of what the research is saying. So I'm, I'm happy to provide that information to you, which can be used as talking points um, to the uh, uh, to policymakers. Um, can can more, I just say one more? Yes, so, sorry, Janet. and there's another question in the box now as well, sure, so yeah. go ahead. Um, it says, um, are you aware of the Ministry of Ed response? Funding directives are already coming to boards connected to the report. Yeah, the Ministry has obviously been in, in close contact with um, the uh, Ontario Human Rights Commission as this report was being developed, so none of this would have come as a, uh, as a surprise. Um, the Ministry uh, seems to have just accepted the report as is in an uncritical way. Uh, and um, I find it, what I find most disturbing uh, is the, the fact that um, uh, there's almost a slanderous approach to the uh, to elementary teachers in the, in the report, namely that all of Ontario education is failing to teach reading effectively. Um, and this is because of balanced literacy instruction. Ontario education is not failing. Ontario is among the top performers in reading in the world. And that is not acknowledged. What is also not acknowledged uh, is the fact that the National Reading Panel highlighted the fact that systematic phonics instruction is an important component of, of developing decoding skills, but it is totally unrelated to reading comprehension after grade one. So these are not acknowledged, they're not uh, addressed. And um, I think there's a need for people to point out to the ministry, to school boards, that yeah, we will, we will follow the, um, what the empirical research, the science of reading is saying, and we will Im implement a strong balanced instruction, a balanced approach to reading that doesn't throw out print access, doesn't throw out classroom libraries, doesn't throw out school libraries, and doesn't inflict uh, standalone um, not engaging phonics instruction on students without an accompanying focus on a rich literacy environment uh, that will engage them in reading and wanting to read. Okay, I'm just, sorry, skimming here. So 
I'm sure we will be reaching out to you <laughs> based on these comments again. <laughs> but it, uh, if there are no other questions. Okay, well, I just wanna say then, thank you so much on behalf of Ergo um, for sharing with us today and for engaging us in a critical look at the Right to Read report and its values and flaws. You've totally debunked our failure, which we appreciate and given us a lot to think about as we plan to uh, best serve our students.